All right, welcome back. Uh, let's get into the next chapter, chapter 20. And this is a interesting chapter, From the Cross to the Throne. OK, so we're going to look at what really happened after the cross. And now we know that Jesus is our high priest. He is in heaven. He's seated at the right hand of the Father. But there are a few things that happen between the cross to the throne, right? Uh, so let's look at a few uh, pointers and we'll uh, go a little quick because uh, we have quite a lot more to complete. So, okay, so from the cross to the throne, on the cross, Luke 23 43, Jesus said, Today you will be with me in paradise. Right? Talking to the thief, he said, Today you will be with me in paradise. So, as Jonah was in the belly of the fish, this is again Matthew 12. Uh, Jesus is saying, just as Jonah was in the belly of the fish, uh, same way the Son of Man will uh, will be put away, and on the third day he will resurrect again. Now let's go down. Let's go to Abraham's bosom, the old paradise. Now, Christ let us know the Lord Jesus. He he told us. He said, "I will be. With, you will be with me in paradise." So, what is paradise? And so we're going to talk a little bit about it, right? Uh, just like right now, there is heaven and there is hell, right? Now, in the Old Testament, uh, before the cross, there was a place called paradise. And paradise was, was it, there was in paradise, there was Abraham's bosom, right? And there was a place of torment. Okay? Uh, understand this, right? So those who... In the old covenant, so for example, there was Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, David, Daniel, those who lived according to God's word. After they died, they went to this place called paradise, which is divided into two sections. One is Abraham's bosom, one is a place of torment. Okay, so in Abraham's bosom, it is a place of comfort and rest. Right? So when David and all the prophets and those who lived holy lives during the old covenant, they went to this place and they rested there in Abraham's bosom. And then there was a place of torment. So those who did not obey God's word, who did not live a good holy life, they were put into this place of torment. Now Jesus gives one example. The rich man and Lazarus. We know the story, right? The rich man was there living his whole life and then there was... Uh, uh, the, the beggar was Lazarus, who was there begging. But when they died, Lazarus went to Abraham's bosom, right? And here, the rich man went to hell, the place of torment, right? And it's interesting to note that the person who was in hell, the rich man, he could feel his mental faculties, his senses, his spirit, his soul could feel everything. He could feel the burning sensation. What does he say? Just give me a drop of that wine that I could just taste it. Then he saw Lazarus. His, uh, the, the, the faculties could, he could see Lazarus. Right? And he also said, oh, nobody else should go through this. So you please go and tell my brothers about this. Right? So we all know the story, right? So when the rich man was in this place of torment, he could, he could feel the pain. There was uh, his mental, his faculty, emotional, the soul, the mind, will, and emotions that was working at that time. Now, when Jesus died, he said, from today, you will be with me in paradise. So he was talking about this place of rest, OK? and. What happened after after Jesus died? Okay, we look at a few scriptures. Let's read 2 Corinthians 12, 1 to 4. This is where Paul was caught up in the third heaven. Here again, he's he's talking about uh, into paradise. Or or before that, let's read Ephesians 4, 8 to 10. Ephesians 4, 8 to 10.
therefore he says when he ascended on high he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men now this he ascended what does it mean but that he also first descended into the lower parts of the earth he who has descended is also the one who ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things okay so now we i won't go too much in detail you'll learn more of this in eschatology uh, that is the end times you'll learn so i'll just do a quick overview right so there's paradise there's abraham's bosom there's a place of torment now after jesus died ephesians 4 he goes and he what he does is he tells the people there that i am the messiah right and he takes them to this place now so right now there is no one in abraham's bosom right it, it is mostly see there's no um, there's no verse that says okay abraham's bosom has become heaven right so it is most likely that this place of abraham's bosom is now closest to heaven right so so now you've got the place of torment which remains unchanged the lake of fire what is the Bible say at the end, Hades will give up their, their dead, right? Uh, so, so to understand this well, Jesus dies. He goes. He 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 tells the prophets and all of those in Abraham's bosom, uh, I I am the one. I'm the Messiah you all talked about. So now he led these people up to heaven. So right now there is heaven and there is hell. Understood, everyone? Yes, right. And you'll learn learn more in detail, uh, maybe in eschatology. But what did he do? He made a proclamation to the spirits in prison, meaning uh, those who are held. Right, they were not yet enjoying uh, the blessings of heaven. Right, and so now on the resurrection morning, Mark chapter sixteen and verse eight, and then even in John twenty, Jesus says, "Do not touch." Sorry, uh, in the resurrection morning, Jesus says, don't touch me. But eight days later, right, Jesus appeared to his disciples. And this time, see, Thomas is doubting. He says, uh, okay, you remember that, you know, when, when Mary Magdalene saw Jesus, she went to touch Jesus. What did Jesus say? Don't touch me because I have not yet returned to the Father, right? And now, eight days later, Thomas is saying, I won't believe until I touch Jesus. Jesus comes into the room and says, Thomas, come and touch. Come and touch the nail pierced hands. Come and touch the side. Right? So, John 20, verse 26 to 28. And after eight days, his disciples were again inside, and Thomas was with them. Jesus came to the doors being shut and stood in the midst and said, Peace to you. Then he said to Thomas, Reach your finger here, look at my hands. Reach your hand here and put it into my sight. Do not be unbelieving, but believing. And Thomas answered and said, my Lord and my God. So what happened? It is most likely that in those eight days, within those eight days, God, the Lord Jesus has gone. He descended. He ascended into heaven. He took those captives captive. He went up to heaven. He made atonement. He took his blood. He poured it into the Holy of Holies, and he said, the price has been paid. And now, he's come back, eight days later, he's coming and he's saying, touch and see. Flesh and blood. Because I'm flesh and blood, you touch and see. I have the resurrected body. Right? And, and so that's what happened. So, uh, somebody raised their hands. Lucy? Yes, brother. Brother, was the ascension of uh, of Jesus Christ uh, was after forty days of oh, his uh, resurrection? Minute. Lucy, one minute. Uh, your voice is breaking. Just, just one minute, right? Uh, yes. Go ahead. Ask a question again. Brother, uh, Jesus Christ after his resurrection, uh, his ascension happened after the forty days of his resurrection. No. So after he died. Mm. Right after he died, okay. the Lord Jesus he yeah. descended. He went into uh, 
paradise into Abraham's bosom. Ephesians okay. 4 says he led the captives captive. So there were people in the old covenant who were play, who were in this place of comfort, right? Okay. So for example, okay. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and all the men, mm -hmm. of, men and women of God. So they're in this place of comfort. So what he did was he went there. He told them of what he has accomplished through the cross and he led them into heaven into yes. god's presence mm -hmm. so right now there is no abraham's bosom is, is it, it doesn't so it's deep what does paul say to be absent in the body is to be present with him. right so abraham's bosom is no longer there right but there are some scholars who say that abraham's bosom becomes heaven Right, but that, that that doesn't really matter. What matters is when we are absent in the body, we are present with the Lord. But the place of torment, that is hell, continues to remain the same. Right? Yes. Yeah. So once more. No, brother. After resurrection, he was on the earth for the forty days, brother. Correct. That, Correct. At that time, wanted to get it confirmed. He, okay. you told, uh, you told us that uh, within eight days, he uh, after eight days, the uh, Thomas. He felt him and uh, he knew. Yes. So he was in his resurrected body, right? Uh, so, for example, when you and when when as believers, when we die, we will be changed in the twinkling of an eye. We will have a resurrected body. The Bible here in John twenty it says that the doors were closed, and Jesus walked in. So, in a resurrected body, he also ate breakfast with them, right? So, yes. so Jesus was in his resurrected body. Right, it was a glorified body. So, yes, they could see him. There, there, there was there was flesh and bones to him. Thomas touched him. So, for the forty days, he was there in a resurrected body, and then after forty days, he went up again to the Father. Okay, okay, brother. Okay, awesome. thank you. Yes, go ahead. Yeah. Well, yeah, in line with that, uh, we were actually having a discussion an hour back. So when Jesus appeared to Mary Magdalene, he says, don't cling on to me, for I have not ascended to the Father. the Father. And he also goes on to show his hands to Thomas and says, touch, yeah. so that you will believe. So uh, was it uh, before ascension that he showed his hands to Thomas? Yeah, so it's most likely that when, see, when he told Martha, don't Mary, cling Mary on to me, uh, Mary Magdalene, huh? sorry, uh, don't cling on to me. It's most likely he hasn't gone up to the Father yet, okay. right? So he has to make atonement. Okay. So we read in Hebrews, he goes up to heaven and he made atonement with his own blood, Okay, right? So he went, he went up to heaven, made atonement with the father saying i have made the price i've paid the price hebrews talks about that he made atonement with his own blood and then it was not like jesus said okay i made atonement and left it there so he had to come he came back to the reason for him to come back is to encourage the disciples like he didn't just leave them in the air even though he told his disciples okay you know i'm going to leave you i'm going to be crucified i'm going to go away i'm sending the holy spirit the holy spirit will be like i am there with you but the disciples were weary thomas was weary he said until i touch i won't believe so jesus had to go deal with certain things so he chose to go in his glorified body now if you look at revelations chapter chapter 2 we see jesus i saw john sees a revelation of jesus oh he had hair like wool uh, feet like braze, like grass, and uh, uh, he, from his mouth came the double edges. Now, if he had gone like that, what will his disciples do? When John saw that, they, he fell at his feet as if dead. Right? So he cannot go in that kind of a form. So he had to let go. He had to go in a way that he could relate to the disciples. So he went. He said, so the disciples could recognize him. So some of the things that we can take is, see, the doors were all closed. A glorified body, he just came through that, right? People can recognize. They recognize, hey, this is Jesus, right? And even uh, when the disciples are going in the ship, Peter says, that's Jesus. He jumps off the water and he swims towards him. So they recognize Jesus. So Jesus had to do it just to reinstate everything. So he reinstated Peter as well. He got some things done, the road to Emmaus, right? 
they didn't recognize him until he broke the bread right and so there were some things that he wanted to do he wanted to show that he has overcome death if he had didn't come and he's just saying i overcome death i've overcome death then the disciples what will they do now the moment they saw it they were all like everything changed in them hey jesus is alive we saw it we saw him die we saw him alive we ate food with him we ate fish with him so he's alive and he had to show it now he doesn't have to prove it he doesn't have to come and you know prove that he is alive we know it but since it was just the establishing of the ministry they were going forward so he had to do that because when we were a little confused in the english version it says don't cling on to me mm. to mary mm. and for thomas it says don't uh, he touch yeah but in hindi version both the scenarios it says mujhe chuiye mat okay so but it is 8 days later yeah so that you have to keep in mind here it is immediately here he's made atonement and he's come back right see if god chooses like for example like we are talking right now if the lord chooses he can come here as a man and talk to us if he chooses right yeah if he chooses if he wants to he can come and sit with us one on one face to face and we can talk to him if he chooses to but then there's a glorified jesus we dare we cannot look at his face but what does the book of corinthians and thessalonians paul writes and he says in the twinkling of an eye in the sound of the trumpet we will get a glorified body and we will see him face to face because the incorrupt the corruptible will become incorruptible in our natural eyes with all our sin nature we cannot see him so when we get that glorified body we will see him face to face right so there was a reason why jesus did that right but is he able to do it now if he wants to he can we hear of testimonies where people have seen jesus coming and healing some of them have not seen the face some of them have probably seen the face all these are there uh, so it's all in god's control jesus is control right he he knows so right now what we must understand is there's heaven and there's hell right and it's a choice that we have to make the place of torment doesn't change towards the end in the book of revelations there will be a lake of fire hades will give up all their dead all the all of those who did not believe in jesus okay will stand at the great white throne judgment revelations and they have to give an account and they will be thrown into the lake of fire along with satan and his demons right so we know the end we know that's going to happen there's no change there but here no more abraham's bosom what does jesus say i'm going to the father and he's preparing mansions for you the streets are made of gold now this is not some story it is real it's really going to be like this jesus says when jesus says i'm preparing mansions for you it's not for them to feel happy it is real the streets of gold heaven is a real place right which is far greater than abraham's bosom it's not just a place of comfort it's a place where we will see him face to face because of the cross you understood that difference yes okay and with his own blood he, jesus went into the holy of holies and he made atonement hebrews 9 11 and 12 but christ came as a high priest of the good things to come with a greater and more perfect tabernacle not made of hands uh, and not of this creation not with the blood of goats and calves but with his own blood he entered the most holy place once for all having obtained eternal redemption so within the 8 days this is what would have happened hebrews 9 11 and 12 from mary magdalene to thomas hebrews 9 11 and 12 would have happened he would have went he, he, as a high priest he went and with and and a more perfect tabernacle he made atonement for us the father accepted that perfect sacrifice once for all right he showed himself alive after that if jesus said i am alive and just did nothing about it 
what was the would anything have happened would they be uh, would the disciples be encouraged but there was a reason jesus here's the best part jesus didn't hide oh they're coming let me hide here the romans may see me he was least bothered who's going to see him the bible says he was seen by more than hundreds of people hundreds of people saw jesus i wonder what happened to them because in the end in acts chapter 2 there's only 120 people praying hundreds of people saw they saw jesus alive right and the disciples saw jesus other other followers saw jesus alive Right, so and people can testify to it. He ascended on high. The graves were open in Matthew 27. Now, this is a very peculiar thing that happened. And sometimes we may not understand this portion. Uh, the graves we may, were opened in Matthew 27, 51 to 53, where when Jesus died, let's read it. Matthew 27, 51 to 53. Then Behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth quaked, and the rocks were split, and the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised, and coming out of the graves after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. So there are so on the day when Jesus died, the certain graves were opened. Right. Now, there are many understandings to this. Uh, and sometimes we don't understand a few things from scriptures, no, especially this. And even when Elijah, uh, you know, they were, I think it's not Elijah, when they were carrying the bones of this of this dead body of somebody, and then it fell in the in the book of, I think it was 2 Kings, it fell on Elisha's grave and the person came back to life. So there are some things that are left unexplained. But the main thing that we get, go from here, from this verse, what we can take is the veil was stoned. Meaning, the separation was removed. Maybe it was a way for God to, you know, for the Lord to just express that graves, the dead will come back to life because of what I have done. Right? Maybe it was a way of expressing it. And then in the last portion, he was he is seated on the highest throne. When Jesus went up to heaven, he is seated at the right hand of the Father. Everywhere in the Bible, when you say the right hand, it only means all authority, all dominion, all power given to Jesus. Right? So now when Jesus is there, he's gone back to heaven. Right now, he's seated at the right hand of the Father. And he's making intercession for you and me. He's making intercession. Can you can you picture this? Jesus is praying for you and me on behalf of the Father. He is making intercession for us. Why is he doing it? Because he's our high priest. He's standing on our behalf in front of the Father. So we have a great high priest. And how is he standing? He's not standing, you know with some other blood. He's standing with his own blood. How many of you are excited to go to heaven? Not now. Let me become 85 or 90. That's good. I mean, the psalmist says, with long life, I will satisfy you. It's wonderful. It's good to, uh, you know, it's, it's to live a long life. It's a blessing from God. But it is such a joy. It's such a hope to know that you and I, the moment we pass the shore, the moment we breathe our last, to be absent in the body is to be present with the Lord. That we will be with Jesus. We will see Him. We will be with Him. All that we are doing, all that we are talking about, all that we are trying to understand. You know, there's no need of healing. There's no need of deliverance. There's no sickness, there's no pain, there's no stress, there's no weariness. It is only Jesus. Our eyes are fixed on him. His presence will bring comfort and joy. And there is no sadness there. Book of Revelations, chapter 4 and chapter 5 talks about after the rapture, what will happen. 
millions of people, a, a multitude of people, they're singing to the Lamb who is seated on the throne. He's victorious. Right? So as believers, it's very important every now and then to remind ourselves of the bigger picture that we are here for. It's very important to remind ourselves. You know, I always say this as pastors. That we go for these funerals. And every time we go for the funeral, it's a reminder. What is life? That one day we will pass. Body is going to go. What about our spirit? So it's not a hopeless thing. We don't have, we don't live without a hope. Paul writes to the Thessalonians, don't be without hope. Because we have a hope. Though the physical body may go, is will decay. But the spirit, we will get a glorified body and we will be with Jesus. So that's why Paul writes and he says, death has been swallowed up in victory. Is it a physical death? Yes. But it's, it's, it's destroyed. Because when Jesus lives, right now Jesus lives, so we will live. We will live with him forever. That is the hope that you and I have. So every now and then, remind yourself. Right? It's good to work hard. It's good to you know, earn and do things in the ministry and have plans, have things. But always go back. You know, God, whatever I'm doing, let it bear fruit. Let it bear rewards that are eternal for your kingdom. Eternal rewards. Right? And that's the best place to be in. Right, let's go to chapter 21, the power of his resurrection. One of the greatest testimonies to the resurrection of the Christ that is he still works amongst us, amongst us and he is transforming lives and he's working miracles in our lives. Now tell me something, each one of you, you're here in Bible college learning about the Bible. Why? It's not because you don't know what to do. It's because you know that there's a, there's a God who's alive and who's working in our lives. And you want to know more about God. Even as we you know, spend time in praise and worship, we know that we, as we read the word, as we worship him, he's transforming our lives. And God is still working miracles. He's not going to stop. That is his nature. That's how he is. He's a God who works miracles. You know, you, you, you look at the heavens. The earth is tilted in an axle. Right? So the earth is round. It's tilted. It's like this. So it goes this way. Can you think of that? If it's even moved a little bit towards the left or to the right, there can't be life on earth. If Jesus just takes the earth like this and shakes it like this, over. It's done. So Revelation says, the skies will roll. Have you seen projector screens? Projector screen you've seen? You take out the projector screen and leave it. The ones that are fixed on the wall. Take out the projector screen and leave it. it the projector screen just goes up. Like that, the sky will roll up. The mountains will melt like wax. You've seen candle? How the wax falls down? And that the mountains will melt. Took, think about this resurrected Jesus. And he's still transforming lives, touching lives, working miracles all across the world. Do you think if Jesus was, anyone will follow somebody who is not alive? Why are we talking about him thousands of years later? Why are we still talking about Jesus? Why are we still praying about him? That's because he's alive. Why are we still praying for healing and deliverance and miracles? And why is he still doing? Because he's alive. He's there. He's working in each of our lives. Right? So the resurrection power was seen in the early church. And we see those beautiful, beautiful uh, miracles that the same disciples, Peter and John, went to pray. They met a lame man. What happened? Can you give me some money? Peter and John says, hey, look at me. Silver and gold I don't have, but what I have I give to you in the name of Jesus Christ. Rise up and walk. They didn't go to Bible college. 
they didn't have any anything, no degrees in their hands. You know why the why the Pharisees and the Sadducees were upset with the Jesus and his disciples? Because they Jesus and his disciples were doing things which they could not do. Because they could not do it, they didn't want others to do it. So Peter and John did those miracles. Can you think about the other miracles that happened? So many, right? Uh, the saints had lit up when, when um, Paul was at Lydia. Uh, there was a lame man. And he says, Peter, uh, sorry, Apostle Paul looks at that lame man and says, get up on your feet. He's not walked his entire life. He doesn't know what it means to walk. Paul says, get up on your feet, take care of your mat and go home. He gets up, takes his mat and goes. For 38 years, he did not walk. He doesn't know what it means to walk. Right? We see the resurrection power in the early church. We see in the great miracles that Jesus is doing. He's doing it even now, available for all of us as believers. Jesus is giving the same Holy Spirit to each one of us. What is one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit? The working of? How many of you know all the nine gifts of the Holy Spirit? I know, Pastor. Very good, Gertrude. Okay, those who are here, the nine gifts of the Holy Spirit. Okay, this is your homework. You should know all the nine. Okay, how many of you want to flow in the gifts of the Spirit? Uh, if you want to flow in it, you don't know what it is. How will you flow in it? Right? I want you to learn all the nine gifts of the Holy Spirit and then the fruit of the Spirit. If this is Sunday school stuff. You should know it. Right? All nine. You should know it. You're praying, God, give me the gifts of the Spirit. Jesus is asking, okay, which one you want now? Uh, let me go back to the Bible. No. You got to know it. So if I'm, if I'm going and praying and I'm praying for somebody who's sick, I'm saying, Holy Spirit, you have the gift of working of miracles in you. So, Lord, you release that working of miracles. Let a miracle happen in this place. In Jesus' name. So, what are we doing? Your, the gifts of the Spirit is there. It's available for all of us as believers. Right? But we must know it to walk in it. Okay? So, next class, I'm going to ask everyone what one of the nine gifts. The power of God exerts, the power that God exerts towards us who believe is the resurrection power. The same power which raised Jesus Christ from the dead is working in each of our lives. So when you are praising and worshipping God here, praise and worship that happens here or maybe in your homes, those online, the same Holy Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is the same Holy Spirit that is ministering to you at that time. So what can you expect? You can expect God to work. You can expect God to work miracles. You can expect miracles to happen. You ask in faith and know that God is able to do it. Don't feel only when the prophet comes, only when the healing evangelist comes, there'll be healing. No, it can happen. Right? When you're praying here, when you're, when you're singing songs to God, remember that the same Holy Spirit, praise Jesus, is in you. Right? Revelations 1, 17 and 18, uh, it talks about, uh, you know, the, having the authority of the keys of death and hell. And to have the keys means to have the power over. Jesus has the power over hell and death. You know, somewhere, sometimes we feel, oh, Satan is in control of hell. Operations, all the operations that's happening in hell, Satan is in control. Maybe he's in control of certain operations. But here the Bible says, Jesus has the power over death and hell. If Jesus wants, I'm just helping you to paint a picture. If Jesus wants, he can go down to hell. He can stand and he can say, okay, stop what you're doing about, you know, this is my son, stop what you're doing. Stop all your work against this, he's my son. And he can go back. The demons and the powers of hell will shake 
they will tremble at the name of Jesus. Forget about Jesus going, he just has to say the word. That's the authority that Jesus has, and he has given us that authority. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, his resurrection power is made available to all of us as believers. So when we are ministering to people, when we are you know, serving in the ministry, expect God to work miracles. Don't be in a place where you say, okay, if it happens, it happens. If it doesn't happen, it doesn't happen. No. You've got to have faith. You've got to expect God to work. And when you expect God to work, God sees that and he begins to work. Remember that Roman centurion? It really stuck into me. You've got the Jews who are saying, come Lord, come and heal. No, come and heal those who are sick at home. But this Roman centurion is saying, no, no, Jesus, I've heard about you. You don't even need to come. You just say the word, my servant will be healed. Jesus was astonished, is what the Bible said. That means Jesus said, really? So you believe if I say the word that your servant will be healed at home, you don't want me to come. And this Roman is saying, don't come, just say the word, I know he'll be healed. Look at that faith. And Jesus was astonished. And he says, go, it is done. And, we, and when we, as, as believers, we are, to call, we are called to walk in this resurrection power. To walk in anointing. Now you may ask me, how is it that I don't, you know, I don't see any of this? Maybe we have to press on for more of God. There is a price you have to pay. When we look at the book of Acts, when we look at these great men and women of God, these posters and that we have here, these frames, these are all regular men and women of God, just like you and me. But they sacrificed. They put their faith in God, and they sacrificed things for the for the kingdom for the sake of god and they were able to do great things but it's the same holy spirit that can do great things in our lives same holy spirit all we need to do is to press on to believe i like that verse if you have faith as small as a mustard seed you say to this mountain be removed and be cast into the sea it will be done so there's another verse where, where Jesus is saying, when you, when you ask, believe you have already received it. What measure of faith is that? When you ask, believe you've already received it. And so we are to walk in this kind of resurrection power. Jesus is the resurrection, and he, is, he has walked in resurrection power before his death and burial, and he continues to walk in resurrection power. What is the enemy doing against you? in you or in your circumstances there is a power that is available in you to stop and overthrow the working of the enemy amen when the enemy comes in like a flood the spirit of the lord will raise a standard against it remember god is fighting for you god is fighting for you he will not we have such wonderful promises in his word he says, hey, I'm fighting for you. I will stand with you. Stand still. You see the salvation of the Lord. The battle is not yours. It's mine. I will fight you. You just trust me. He's telling the Israelites, you don't worry about the Red Sea. I will handle the Red Sea for you. You just stand still and you see what I'm going to do now. What you have never thought in your mind, I will do it now. I will part the seas into two. Yeah, the Israelite says, were there no graves in Egypt? You brought us here to die. They are complaining to God. But God is saying, hey, stand still. I'm going to fight this for you. I brought you out. So I will take you out. You stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. So no matter what circumstance you're going through, whatever impossibility, or whatever plan that you have ahead, Maybe you have a plan to start your own ministry, a big vision ahead, and you see yourself and you're saying, God, how is it even going to happen? I don't have the finances. I don't have the resources. I don't have people. I don't have money. I don't have anything with me. Don't worry. You stand still, meaning you trust God. Right? Hebrews 11 talks about faith, and he says, 
by faith they subdued kingdoms and authorities. So you stand, you believe God. If you prayed for it, you believe that God can do it. If you haven't prayed for it and you don't believe, it will not happen. Right? If you pray, if you haven't prayed for it and you don't believe that God can do it, it will not happen. You gotta believe, you gotta have faith, you gotta trust God. Right? Even in the impossibilities, even in those challenges, you trust God, God will uh, make a way for you. So remember that, right? Uh, the resurrection power of Jesus is working in us. Let's go quickly to chapter 22. The way of the cross. How does the cross affect our daily lives? Right? Uh, the cross is an offense. When I say the word offense, what is offense? Any other feeling? Oh. Sometimes you eat something as oh. Offense is something that is it, it, it is deeply disturbs you. Galatians 5.11 And I, brethren, if I still preach circumcision, why do I still suffer persecution? And the offense of the cross has been seized. Paul is saying, if they are beating me up and putting me into prison and, and you know uh, causing all this trouble to me, if it's because of circumcision, it's no use. If I preach circumcision, I'm safe. But the moment I say there was a man who came, there was God who came down as a man, he died on the cross to call my sins, people get upset. They're angry. They say, how can God die on a cross? It is not making any sense. It is silly. What you're talking is rubbish. We cannot believe this. That's why they beat him up, put him into prison. So Paul is saying to them, if I talk about circumcision, my life will be peaceful. No problems. But I'm not talking about circumcision. I'm talking about the cross of Jesus Christ. It's an offense. It's going to be an offense till the end of time. Till Jesus comes back, it'll be an offense. So people say, hey, what, you're a Christian. What do you believe in the cross and all? That's okay. It is an offense. You can't help it. But it is also the power of God. Right? If people ridicule you and mock you because you're a believer, and you believe in the cross of Jesus Christ, it's okay. It's, it's a natural thing. That means you're in the right place. Right? If you, if you are persecuted for your faith, you're in the right place. It's an offense. There's separation from the world. Galatians 6, 14. But God forbid that I should boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. A life of self-denial. No man is a friend of the cross of Christ. No man who is the friend of the cross of Jesus Christ will give license to his passions, indulgence, and he, he will not give license for the enemy to come and work in his life. Right? If the cross of Jesus Christ is working in your lives, you will not let the things of this world affect you. You know, sometimes people ask me, you know, there are times people ask me, what do you do to enjoy yourself? I say, I love to play with my children. We like to go out every now and then as a family. So what do you do? Because I don't have a Facebook account. I don't have Instagram. I don't have any of these other things. I, I, you know, WhatsApp, I use it sometimes very minimal. Because in ministry, we get all these WhatsApps and messages, and, and so I have to coordinate. I, 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 it doesn't matter to me, all of these. See, Instagram, Facebook is very good. I'm not saying it's not good. Right? It's a wonderful means of um, you know, reaching out to people. But I don't waste my time on that. I don't have a personal account. I don't see how many people. I don't even know how to open the Instagram thing. I don't know. I don't know what it is, first thing. And I don't want to know it. Now, people may say, oh, then you are not, you are living in the ancient times. I say, that's okay. That's okay. You should be in line with what's happening now. Yeah. I have to, if my work requires me to have Instagram, I will have Instagram. 
my work doesn't require me to have Instagram and Facebook and all of this. I don't waste my time. It's a waste of time for me. I would rather spend that one hour on my knees praying, seeking God, or reading God's word. I'd rather do that. Right? And, and there are times when we'll have to separate ourselves from the things of this world. It's very important to be willing to do that, right? People may not accept you at that time. That's okay. It's okay. They didn't ex accept Jesus. It's all right. No, I'm not saying don't have Instagram, okay? I, I've said this before, you know, when I joined Bible College, the first week, second week i was you know i was working in the corporate sector so i was using a phone and all of that and uh, somewhere in my spirit i felt this phone is disturbing me i've come for studies i have to study i have to prepare myself so i woke up in the morning i took the phone i put it in a toilet and flushed it and so for the next two years i didn't have a phone with me and my friends were, why did you give me the phone at least I said no I, I don't want a phone why did you do this? How much is the phone? Doesn't matter. What matters is I've come here for the sake of the gospel. I have to learn. I have to grow. Okay, don't have to do this, right? But why am I sharing all this? Because there's a cost, there's a price we have to pay at times. We have to be willing to do it. Right? And when you do it, you, know, you, you feel this assurance. You know that God is working in your life, right? The, you be fellowship in his sufferings, right? So again, Paul writes in many places to the believers, to Timothy, and he says, hey, there is going to be sufferings, but we fellowship in that sufferings. Just like how Christ suffered, we, we, we fellowship in the suffering. But we know that the suffering is not the end. One day we will see him, we will be with him. All suffering will cease and we will be rewarded for our suffering. God is not going to turn a blind eye to all our sufferings. He's going to reward us for our faithfulness, right? And then there are enemies of the cross. The enemies of the cross of Jesus Christ who try to be little, meaning try to make the cross as something which is very not even real or very superficial, right? They make the cross, enemies of the cross, people in the world, um, right, who have many reasons. They say, okay, the cross is not even real. It was not God who died. It was just a good man, just a prophet who died, or, or just a leader who died. And he's nobody. Right? Just a good man. Enemies of the cross. Then you have enemies of the cross in church, where there, is, there are Paul states that whose God is their belly. Right? They indulge in self-indulgence, whose glory is in their shame, who live worldly lives with worldly thinking. Right, and we are told that their end is destruction. There are enemies of the cross. The number one thing the devil doesn't want you to believe is that Jesus died on the cross and rose again from the dead, and he is alive today. He doesn't want you to believe in the cross, so he will make up stories and all kinds of stories, deceptions, and lies. Actually, Jesus escaped. He went into uh, you know, the Himalayas. He was sitting there. And that's how from that came the whole yoga movement. Or then you have these other ideas. Actually, instead of Jesus, there was another person who went on behalf of Jesus. Or there's another study which says, okay, the angels came, brought him down. And thirdly, there's, uh, you know, Jesus did not, he died on the cross, but he didn't resurrect the O, oh, the soul, the soul, the disciples. In the book of John, it's written that this, the, you know, they still believe that the disciples stole the body and went. So there's a group of people who believe that. The enemy can bring in all kinds of things because he does not want you to believe that Jesus died on the cross. He's forgiven your sins. He can bring healing. And today he's alive. He doesn't want you to believe that. So he can bring anything into your mind and my mind. Here's what it is. When we know the word of God, we stand on that. So we can tell the devil, hey, I believe, because that's what the word of God says. Finally, when we don't believe, we are crucifying the Son of God afresh. Hebrews 6, 4 to 6. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift 
and I've become partakers of the Holy Spirit and I've tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come. If they fall away to renew them again to repentance since they crucify again for themselves the Son of God and put him to an open shame. Every time you and I as believers, we choose to go back. Knowingly, we choose to go back to a different life or, or to sin and to the enemy. We are crucifying Jesus once again. Right. And so we thank God for what he has done through the cross. And so we've completed this section. Next class, next week, we will start with uh, section three, the blood of Jesus Christ. Right. Thank you so much. Thank you for those who are online. Uh, have a great weekend. I'll see you all next Friday. God bless.